Hello everyone, I'm Punt Dribble, and it is a sad day here at Touchdown Boys. Uh, if you haven't been monitoring the situation, just a real quick update. What happened was, a few days ago, there was an intramural intergender rugby match in the city of Auckland, New Zealand. And about halfway through what would normally be the length of the game, one of the teams scored what we now realize is the last point. There are no more points left. You can't score any more points. Touch as many downs as you want. Slam as many dunks. There's just no points to get. Uh, we should have known something was up because in the middle of a friendly pasta dinner, our good friend and friend of the show, the football from Rudy, did. In fact, at the exact moment the last punt, uh, point was scored, he uh, lifted himself into the air like the Lorax and yeeted himself into the great beyond. And I know wherever he is right now, football's looking down on us, and he's expecting great things. And, and this is going to be the end of Touchdown Boys for the foreseeable future without points really can't have any sports and we were especially big fans of the points here at touchdown boys i don't necessarily want to give up hope i do think there's a path forward for sports without points in this sort of post peak point world but we're not going to be able to figure that what out figure out what that is for a long time so we are going to go on indefinite hiatus and in the meantime i'm going to turn the show over to uh, my friend and secret half-brother, Nate, uh, who's going to introduce a new show here called Pitch Perfect, the podcast, not the movie. Um, you know, I'm gonna, we're going to stay strong. We're going to get through this, but uh, now I'm going to hand the show over to Nate. Take it away, Nate. Hey everybody, uh, thanks Punt. I'm Nate, I sound exactly the same as him, uh, because we're secret half-brothers. And you're listening to Pitch Perfect, the podcast, not the movie. And joining me is my co-host, Josh. Say hi to the people, Josh. Hi, um, I, what just happened? Am I seeing double Nate? Uh. Why are there, why, why were there two of you? No, you can tell the difference between me and Punt because, uh, he's got, um, just a huge schlong. Just a killer hog that I just do not have. You know, we talked about this. We talked about making the podcast too horny. I know. I said no. I voted no overwhelmingly. I know, I know, I know. But it's just the easiest way to tell the two of us apart. And plus, he's going to, uh, they're going to seal him inside of the Dick's Sporting Goods like a pharaoh. So we're not going to see him uh, again. And so maybe one day when the world needs him most, he'll return uh, to talk about sports again. When sports are reborn in the future. Speaking of sports, I walked past our uh, guest room today and after I got finished working on uh, Paddington 2, Paddington's Revenge, where they're remaking the sequel to Paddington. Before the third one comes out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was, I was finishing up with my, uh, my bear suit for that. I played the ghost of Paddington's uncle. Like a, kind of like a force ghost thing? Yes, but I still had to be in the first suit. Oh, obviously. Anyway, so I got I got back from that, and I was taking my first hit off, and I noticed a giant football-sized hole in the poster mm-hmm. that you put over our uh, our guest room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That... And uh, here's here's the thing. A lot of unfinished pasta, right? We, we don't have a budget anymore. Ever since you drunkenly convinced me to make a uniform for the show where it's just a hat and a t-shirt with your face on it, mm-hmm. winking, saying, what's up? My main man. Well, we gotta look professional. That's cool, and that's fine. But we we can't afford to have any more guests this season if we can't keep them in a locked room. Yeah, yeah. That is gonna be a real struggle. And, you know, with that hole, I don't have any more posters to put over the hole. So it is gonna get cold in there. Uh, <laughs> which would be an issue if we had any guests, because they'd get too chilly. So I don't know what we're gonna do. I mean, I think we're just going to have to go it alone through this final stretch of the Ernest journey. I guess so. All right. We lost our guests, and we lost all points for that for games. The mm-hmm. thing is, like, video mm-hmm. games can survive, because not all video games require you to score points. Some of them are missed. This is very true. Uh, but should we get on with it? Yeah, we should get on with it. That's what the football from Rudy would have wanted. <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> Alright, 
Uh, so, an orphan of a dead planet, losing his stepfather, but not his dog, to a tornado, left alone with his mother Martha in a dark world with horrible writing. The infamous hero is now the man of the hour, Ernest P. Worrell. The best being in position to use his amazing powers in a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way, Ernest has assumed the disguise of a mild-mannered, fired mechanic with lofty goals of being together with that one-leggy waitress he has a thing for. That's right, welcome to The Importance of Being Ernest, where my co-host and I talk about Ernest's incredible legacy and how things might have been different if our hero Jim Varney hadn't returned to his home planet so soon. Yes, of course this is. We're, I mean, we're still in de- knee deep in the first season of Pitch Perfect, the podcast, not the movie. And when we get to the end, we will pitch the perfect Ernest movie. And I kind of wish I hadn't said this line before because it's more true now. Hopefully the one we pitch will be very far away from the movie that we watched for this episode. Because spoiler alert, this one blew ass. Hey, we talked about making the podcast do horny. Cut it out. I'm sorry. This one kissed ass. No, that's, that's a different thing entirely. This one was very <laughs> bad. It was a bad movie that I did not enjoy. What what uh what did we watch this week, Nate? We watched Ernest Goes to Africa. Do you think, should I give him a little bit of a synopsis about what happened in the movie? Give you him know a what? Primer on the events. I feel I feel bad for you after doing the synopsis week after week. And I well, think but I r- actually gonna... wrote it down this time. <laughs> no, it's okay. I think I'm going to take this one for you. Okay, uh, I got sure. this. I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the bullet for you on this one. Okay, but I so, have some funny jokes in mind. It's okay. It's okay. okay. I got this. Uh, so. What you have to understand about this movie is that it starts deep in the jungle, right? And we see this adventurer, and it looks like he might in danger. But we realize that he's not in danger, and he just runs into a couple of friendly bears. And he teaches them all about London, right? And the bears start to make marmalade, and they love London. And uh, then Josh, this guy leaves. You can't. You can't. I know. I want to <laughs> live in this world, too, where we watch Paddington. But we can't. We watch Ernest Goes to Africa, which is a bad movie. And not a beautiful, oh. wonderful movie that just kind of has one part that's not very good, like Paddington. This is a movie that has a whole bunch of parts that are really bad. Okay, first and foremost, I'm contracted to always talk about Paddington. I apologize. Mm-hmm. So that just that just came out. Secondly, there's nothing bad about Paddington. Please don't get me fired again. Sure. But, I mean, there's that one part where the guy... There's the one part that's basically in this movie, too. <laughs> Actually. Uh, this movie isn't content to just have the bad parts of itself. It also has to have the bad parts of better movies in it. I, well, I, again, I'm not... Don't get me fired. You got me fired from the water horse, and I will never forgive you for that. Mm-hmm. Especially that after the they made you job. have that surgery to look like a water horse. I know. <laughs> Uh, no, what, I, I'll tell the people what actually happened in this movie. Okay. So, we start with a prologue where two colonialist scumbags steal from an African tribe, and then the more British of the two scumbags betrays the more hat-wearing of the two scumbags and leaves them for dead. Then we cut to Ernest, who's a mechanic, but he, like, immediately gets fired for wrecking a weirdly dressed client's car with some tedious slapstick. Then he goes to the one of Waffle, which is, like, an off-brand Waffle House where he's arbuckling a waitress named Renee. And she wants adventure, but she thinks he's boring. So then he goes to a flea market, and he stumbles into a struggle between a thief, the henchman of a prince, and the British betrayer guy who's working for said prince. And this is where you realize that, despite being pretty boring, this movie's also kind of weirdly convoluted. Anyway, they all want to get these jewels called the Eyes of Egoli, but Ernest unknowingly buys them... And then Thompson, that's the name of the British Betrayer guy, he kills the thief with a vehicular snake bag, and then he starts to hunt Ernest. So then Ernest goes, and you see there's a lot of so then in this movie because it's poorly written. So then Ernest turns the jewels into a yo-yo, which he gives to (laughs) Renee as a present. But then Thompson sees this, and he kidnaps her. And then Ernest goes to save her, and then he gets kidnapped also, and they all go to Africa. But then Ernest falls out of a truck, and but then also magically just walks into where Thompson's having a meeting with the prince's agent, and he disrupts it by spying on them while wearing brownface and doing a racist Indian accent. And so he's spying on them while he's in brownface, but then he finds Renee, and he rescues her while in Nelda face. And then they fart around in the savannah for a while, and nothing really happens. 
and then the prince just gets Renee uh, like off screen and so then Ernest dresses up as like a harem girl and they do a bunch of really bad trans panic humor and then they escape and there's a long convoluted escape scene that involves ostrich eggs but isn't as funny as that would sound, make it sound then they fart around some more. They run into the Sinkatu tribe, which is the tribe that the eyes were stolen from. These guys are cannibals, and it's really racist and sucks. Uh, but then Yo Ernest does yo-yo tricks, and that makes them like him. Then Thompson shows up in Mortal Kombat cosplay, and he has a trial by combat with Ernest that's all slapsticky and has a couple kind of funny parts in it, actually. Uh, but then Ernest wins, and he returns the jewels, and he saves Renee, and they go home, and she dumps him for being too exciting. Yeah, just like Paddington won. Yeah, basically, it's, basically, Paddington is a remake of Ernest Goes to Africa. Uh, Jesus Christ, Nate. When you line it out like that, it sounds like we watched a nightmare. It's a bad movie. I, yeah, no, for real, <laughs> though, I did, like, writing out the synopsis. I was like, I, this, I actually like it less somehow. I already didn't like it. And, like, once I'm like, okay, so this is all that happens in it, I was like, oh, no, this is bad. I, the thing that it made me realize specifically writing out was like how unnecessarily complicated the setup is. It's like the guy steals the jewels and then off screen a character steals the jewels from him. And then someone hires him to get the jewels back even though they were already his. No, it's worse guy, than that. No, it's worse than that. Tell me how it's worse than that. The guy, Thompson. Yeah. Abandoned his Indiana Jones friend to yes. steal the jewels from a tribe that's also a cannibal very racist then mm -hmm. according to the storyline of this movie abdul kazim a prince from india that's also in africa stole it from him then this thief who worked for kazim named raboys or roboys or rabas very unclear i think it's robins it's red robins uh red robin Stole it from uh, Kazim, and then Kazim was chasing after him, and then Thompson intercepted and tried to steal it from that guy, but Ernest stole it from that guy, unintentionally. That's the convoluted scenario. Okay, well, it's all really bad. It doesn't. It's just like, it just could have, why wasn't it just that he, like, they get stolen from one person, and then that person's trying to get them back. Why are there, like, three extra thieves in this fucking movie? And the first thief does not matter once Ernest gets the jewels. By then, he's already been killed by having a bunch of snakes dumped on him in a Yes. Limousine. So let's, um, we're, we're jumping ahead of ourselves. Let's, let's do the thing that we do where we rate the movie. Uh, and I think, like, we're in for a okay. treat because, you know, the way we describe this movie, it sounds like we didn't rate it well. No. See, the thing is, like, okay, so I described all that, and, and you, what you assumedly glean from this is, like, the movie's kind of boring and disjointed, poorly paced and written, and racist. This is all true. What you're not getting from the synopsis is also that it's bad in pretty much every other way a movie can be bad. It's, we, like, the, the, the one that sticks out the most to me is that the editing is bad. And when it, you, when you, when the editing is bad, with quotes, like, when you notice that the editing is bad, that means it's really bad. Because good editing is supposed to be invisible. I don't think it has to be invisible. That's a whole other thing that I kept getting into arguments with professors in college about. But if you notice the editing at all, something's kind of off. If you notice it and it's like, you notice that it sucks, it is abysmal. It, the editing is so bad in this. At one point, we both thought that a totally new character had shown up. But it was just a character that was already in the scene. There's, like, no time... Unless they're padding it for time by having the characters do nothing while walking between... Uh, he, said, he said Paddington. That counts. Uh, Paddington producers. He said Paddington. I get $50. Unless they're Paddington for time. $100. <laughs> characters walking places. There's no indication that any time has passed. It feels like characters are just teleporting around... It, it either feels like they're just teleporting around Africa or that every location in this movie is, like, two feet away from the previous location. And, I mean, and the, the music is the other thing. This has awful music. It all sounds like it's, like, free, royalty-free music. None of it fits the situation. So much of it, like, sounds like... I don't fucking know. Like, it came off of, like... 
like out of an educational computer game and it's so like light and weightless that it like sucks all the sort of like gravity and reality out of the scenes like characters will be like running around in a chase and the music will be like and it's like why is that playing over this <laughs> or, or like there's a part where I forget what it is I think it's Ernest walking around the flea market and it's just bluegrass music for no reason and it just doesn't fit it sounds like it came up on shuffle and it was distracting throughout the entire movie. Yeah, and it's just, and it's the least funny one, too, on top of all. Not to mention the most racist one. Well, of course it's the most racist. But yeah, even setting all that aside, even if somehow, which I think would be impossible because of the plot of the movie, but if somehow you cut out all the racist stuff, it would still be the worst Ernest movie. I could definitely agree with that. Uh, so what, after all that, like out of ten, what would you rate it? One. One. One out of ten. Well, the worst possible score I can give a movie. Fuck this fucking movie. So that is a half star out of five stars. And by golly, I could not agree with you more. Uh, everything you said. Plus, this movie is another straight to VHS earnest movie. Like uh, the one that came yes, before. It looks like shit. It looks more like shit. This is the shittiest looking earnest movie yes. yet. Even the hat. That Ernest wears on top of the sets, the music, everything looks like shit. <laughs> yeah, his hat is—he's got a bad hat in this. It's, I mean, it's ostensibly the same kind of hat, but it looks cheaper and it fits him less. It's like this weird khaki thing that's like bunched up. It's weird. Like I don't know if anyone that's not us who's just watched all of the other ones would notice, but I certainly notice that he's got the worst hat ever in this mm -hmm. one. The hat scores are way below the charts. Yeah. It doesn't have the two guys. That's another thing that it doesn't have. Like, so, there's really nothing nothing to, like, latch mm -hmm. onto in this. Yeah, it's just... The transitions you mentioned, they're awful. Uh, they specifically make frequent use of a scream transition. <laughs> Where one character yeah, screams yeah. and they zoom in on the mouth and then another character is screaming. They do this, like, five times. It's ridiculous. Mm. Uh, the music, you, you um, specifically, like, shouted out to the banjo. Like, dun -dun 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 -dun, at the flea market, where it's just nonsense. And it just feels so weightless. Mm. Yeah, there's even one point uh, where I, I get obsessed with these tiny little details, where Ernest is trying to not buy a birdhouse, but ends up buying a birdhouse. And for some reason, the sound effects guys are like, we need bird sounds in this. Even though, like, when you buy a birdhouse, it's, that's not how that works. It doesn't come with birds. <laughs> you don't get birds with your birds. bird squatters in there. Can you imagine if that's how that worked? It's all part of what makes this feel very tv -y, but, like, cheap. TV is there is just yeah there's just constant fucking sound effects. They will we'll probably talk about it at another point, but there's a thing that they do with sound effects on animals that's weird in this movie. I don't even know if that's bad, but yeah, it's like if you ever go back and watch like Fairly Odd Parents now, it's it's like unsettling at points because it's like oh literally just everything gets a sound effect, and that's kind of what this movie is, but they're all really cheap sound. Yes, effects. this movie is the Fairly Odd Parents. Of Ernest, please. Yes. Uh, I mean, another, like, big thing that you hit that was, like, also vital for me in my rating is just this movie, the plot is, like, 40 minutes long. There are so many padding for time scenes. Paddington for time scenes. $150. Oh uh, and there's, like, one particular scene, which we'll probably go into a little bit more, uh, with elephants and a go-kart. That literally goes on forever. It was so awful. Did you do? Did you rate it? What are you? What are I'm you giving it the same. I agree with you. One out of ten, half star out of five stars. This is the worst Ernest I have ever seen. It is. It's so. It just breaks my heart that, like, I wish, I wish that Goes to School could have been the worst one. I wish this one didn't exist. I mean, that's part of why I'm giving it such a low score. Is like. This is the only one where if I had the power, I would erase it. From like, look, we talked about our eyes bleeding from rides again and our minds breaking from ghost to school. I think this one just killed our souls. 
yeah, this one was it, was, it was miserable. I was dreading watching it the whole time, and honestly, like, in a way, it was worse than I thought it was going to be. Because, of, like I said, like, all the other stuff is bad, too, besides it just being really problematic. Do you want to get into t- trying to talk, find some high and points amidst all of the low points of this movie? Uh, I guess. <laughs> it's going to be hard. I have very few. I have a few high points. They're all little, small, incidental jokes. Do you do you have a broader one, maybe, at all? I know I'm like, I don't mean to put you on the spot like this, but that can kick us off. Do, do you have a high point, or should I just... No, I do I have a high point. So, I have three high points. <laughs> I think I have three, too, so we're good. <laughs> so, what we haven't really talked about in this movie is the Bugs Bunny aspect of Ernest is very strong mm. in this movie. I think this is yes. the closest Ernest has come to just basically being Bugs Bunny. I mean, they just do what is... They just do, like, a couple yeah. Bugs Bunny bits. Like, you, you mentioned the, the harem girl stuff. Uh, and part of that is the dude, uh, Abdul Kazim, falls in love with the guy who's dressed up as a harem girl. Yes, yeah, yeah, they do that bit. Another thing they do, which is on my high points, is Ernest, when he's in the Mortal Kombat fight, hides behind a plank. Now, he starts oh, off yeah, hiding behind a that. table, and then uh, mm-hmm. Thompson, who's the Mortal Kombat character in this scene, and Shadow Ernest, uh, uses weaponry, like literally medieval weaponry, uh, like he had like a pike axe to <laughs> uh, cut parts of the table off and there's only one board left and every time it's like Ernest like come pops out he's like miss me miss me and then like the one board that's clearly skinnier than a person he pops out from behind he's like miss me miss me and you can't see anything but his face popping out and I mean I think that's a good bit regardless yeah it's a fun like live action cartoon bit it's very short and it's not like a good yeah. high total high point oh, dude that's gonna be that's gonna be all of them in this movie that's my first one. Do you want to trade off, or do you want me to keep going? Yeah, I'll, we'll trade off. I'll, I'll, I'll say one. There's a part where Ernest gets the call from Thompson to tell him that he's kidnapped Renee. Oh, just to be clear, we, we didn't say this. Renee is played by Linda Cash, who had been in the previous two movies. This is her biggest role yet. Yeah, she plays the love interest. But also, I do kind of feel bad for her. Yeah, but so there's a part where... So when Thompson calls to uh, tell... Ernest, that he's got captured Renee. He, he's Thompson's voice, he sounds like this. He's like a James Bond villain sort of guy, but not fun or interesting in any way. And he calls and he's like, he thinks that Ernest is some kind of secret agent. Also, I realized that doesn't get paid off at all. That's not even set up, dude. Like, there's no I know. Agent 32 ever. He just somehow thinks that Ernest is Agent 32. We don't know who Agent 32 is. We don't know why that Thompson guy's obsessed with him. We don't know where it even came from, and it's never established that Ernest isn't Agent 32. And for all we know, he still could be. Yeah. I'm waiting the whole movie for, like, okay, like, a guy is going to show up, and it's going to be Jim Varney in a suit, and he's going to be like, well, hello, I'm Agent 32. And it's, like, going to be him playing another character, and it's the gag is going to be that he looks like Ernest. And that never happens at all. That's what the movie should need. It should... We should have Secret Agent Ernest. And I'm going to call that for our pitch. That's a good one. But so anyway, so he calls and he's like, Ernest, I've... I've... I almost said arrested. (laughs) I've illegally arrested your love interest, a.k.a. kidnapping. And Ernest goes like, I'm Ruthie. How'd you get this number? (laughs) The doctor said you couldn't get this number. And I thought that was funny. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I like the idea that Ernest has an aunt that sounds like a British supervillain and who would kidnap his girlfriend. Also, that he's hiding from his aunt Ruthie and that he wouldn't want her to have his number. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was like a pretty funny bit. But the other thing is, like, that's another one where there should be a payoff to that where his aunt shows up and looks like Ernest but is dubbed over with the British guy's voice and it's like and she's like hello Ernest are you coming to Thanksgiving and she's agent 32 oh god see this movie sucks so yeah so that's my high point but also it's kind of a low point because I thought there was going to be a fun punchline and there wasn't okay do you have, an, do you have another high point am I, am I doing yeah you go okay. now 
So you, you kind of mentioned this in your synopses of the movie. And I, I mean, you're right. So this portion of the movie where Ernest and Renee hijack a creepy ostrich farmer's truck and oh, then God. use the ostrich eggs in the back of his van to throw at the people that are chasing and shooting them. It's not great, but in a movie full of low points, it's mm. probably like one of the funnest sequences of the movie. Oh, sure. Relatively, it is a... Yes, relative to the rest of the movie, it's a high point. But it's also also kind of a low point because I don't ever want to watch a movie that makes me nostalgic for Ernest Rides Again. Well, that's the thing. This movie is kind of a rehash of Ernest Rides Again. So Ernest Rides Again, they did the Indiana Jones spoof, right? Yeah. This movie, they're doing an Illinois Smith spoof. Yeah. They mention Illinois Smith with very little setup. He's clearly supposed to be this universe's Indiana Jones pastiche. I was confused, and I googled Illinois Smith, and it turns out he's a, there is a real man who is called that, and he is a football coach. And I was like, this is a weird reference. And then they make it again, and I was like, oh, okay, he's supposed to be Indiana Jones. Uh, yeah, you know also, what? Also, the guy at the beginning who steals the eyes of a goalie and gets betrayed by Thompson is pretty much dressed exactly like Indiana Jones. Yeah, and that's like kind of fun in a cynical way where it's like, oh, here's Indiana Jones. He's fucking dead. Like, <laughs> that's that's kind of fun. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, you know what Rides Again also ha- does better than this? Romance. I, I'm much more invested in the relationship between Ernest and Professor Mellon than I am between Ernest and Renee. I mean, I think the low point of every Ernest movie, and I'm going to get into this later, I'm sure, is that... Ernest shouldn't have romance in his life. He's, no, it's weird because he can't have a <laughs> Ernest workout. should just be asexual. Well, because he's like a big kid. It's weird. It's very weird. The best it works is when it's just an unrequited crush in Goes to Jail. Or just their co-workers, and there might be a thing, but you have to read too much into it, like Goes to Camp. Yeah. But I mean, like, yeah, yes. It's But it's when it's, when it's ex- explicit like this... It's or like Slam Dunk Ernest, where it's really weird. Mm-hmm. It's all it, it ends up being uh, off putting in a way. So ostrich egg fling that was my high point because it's it's just fun in that it's bubble, but it's like relatively fun. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's your final third high point, and then I'll do my final third. Well, I actually kind of have two more. I realize now because I put a oh. random note in the middle that I thought cut him off. But I'll just do two of them. Uh, well, well, no, two of them go together. So I'll do mine, and then you do yours, and then I'll do one last one. That's the last two. Uh, there's a part where they're fleeing in, like, a golf cart uh, that has, like, fake bushes on top of it uh, that they steal from, like, this, ho- I guess from the hotel where Thompson and the prince's agent are meeting where Ernest does the awful brown face part. Uh, and the Thompson and his bodyguard are chasing them in a helicopter. And the bodyguard looks down and he's like, there's a large bush moving down the road. And they don't, like, acknowledge that. Thompson's just like, follow it. And that was pretty funny. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there's a similar scene where they're hunting for the coke cart. Where Thompson is berating his empo- employee, Bazoo. Mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. you know, great right. name. Yes. He's saying, Bazoo, you can't even, you can hunt leopard, but you can't hunt a go cart. And Bazoo's like, the leopard is more predictable. And like in a bubble, yeah. that's funny. Yeah. What's your what's your last high point? So my last high point is an element, another element of the Mortal Kombat fight. We see Thompson pull out all this medieval weaponry. He's got a scimitar. He's got a pike axe. He's got a katana. He's got all this shit. And then we see Ernest and his stuff of weaponry. And I guess I don't know if it's like things that he got from his pocket. Or just hammer space, because he's Bugs Bunny? I don't know. I don't understand. But Ernest's weapons include uh, a teddy bear, a rubber chicken, a bologna sandwich, and a whole tube of bologna. And I think just him, like, opening the roll reveal was funny on its own. Yeah. my So my last high points, I believe, are both in the Mortal Kombat fight. There's a part where... Ernest says, nice shot, Dipwad. <laughs> and that was funny to me. I like <laughs> Dipwad dip as an insult. Uh, there's also a part, a gag, that's just a genuinely good gag, where Thompson swings with like a machete and gets it stuck in like a tree. 
and, and Ernest laughs at him and says, like, you're stuck. And then he just lets go of the machete and punches Ernest in the face. He doesn't just punch on Ernest, he wails on Ernest. Yeah, like... yeah, it's like a big Popeye punch. Yeah. <laughs> and that was funny. And that is the last of my high points. What a abysmal movie that that was all we could come up with. Yeah, I know. Oh my god. Like, I'm thinking back to, like, I was re-listening to our first episode, and we got to, like, the high points in Ghost to Camp, and we're, like, laughing before we start to describe them. Mm-hmm. And this is, like, we're like, yeah, that was pretty funny, I guess. In a bubble. But there's also a bad part of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um... Do we do we want to get into low points? Or do we want to fight high points? Oh, you want to decide the best high point before we get into the low points? I mean, you tell me. Sure, let's do it. What did you think? What was your highest high point? I honestly, it's all fucking. I can't pick one of these. <laughs> None of them are that good. <laughs> I think you just have to pick one, and I just have to pick one, and then we have to we have to Mortal Kombat it. Yeah, I think that your stuck one is my highest high point. I think my choice is my go to uh, the first one. The Ernest hides behind a single plank, because just like for that one second, it's pretty, it's pretty good imagery. Okay, well, this is where you, sir, are exposed as a liar, because we do have a guest, an important guest. We'll determine which of these high points is the actual high point. May I introduce the honorable Wheel Armstrong? Ho ho! The first wheel on the moon. Yeah, one small step for man. One gentle roll down a slope for wheels. It's a classic catchphrase. Uh, wheel, which uh, which one of these high points is actually the highest? And having been to the moon, the highest spot in the world, uh, you're a, an authority on this. Um, did you did you say your high point? <laughs> your high high point? I, I said it was the your stuck part. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. cool. Uh, they're both in that fight. I guess that fight could wait. Should we just compromise and say the fight is the high point? No, we already set up wheel. We have to. We have to roll it. Yeah, wait, I'm sorry. We can't. Yeah, we can't do that to wheel. He, look at look at him. Look at him. He's ready. Yeah, he agrees with you. Uh, of course he does, because we're right. So the highest high point of the lowest low point of the Ernest movies is that part where Ernest does like a Looney Tunes bit where he hides behind a plank that's actually too small to hide him. Yep. I'm fine with that. That's a funny gag. I mean, it's not as funny as a pig in headphones. No, no, no. Nothing's as funny as... Well, lots of things are more funny than that. But I do still... Never mind. We don't, I don't want to talk about that anymore. Let's talk about the low points. When we struggle to find high points, there are a plethora of low points to pick from. Mmm, plethora. <laughs> it's, no, no, because it sounds too much like placenta. There's a placenta of low points to pick from. I mean, that makes this more sense, because this is our worst episode, right? disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on. Okay. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, I got yes. one. I'm ready. My low point is the whole movie. All right, Nate, your turn. <laughs> Dude, I can't. I was... <laughs> My uh, my mom asked me, like, oh, how was the movie? Because she knew we were, like, we're watching it yesterday recording today. And I was like, I'm really struggling philosophically to decide with whether or not a whole movie can count as a low point. <laughs> now, now, having said that, and standing by it, I do have three specific especially parts of the movie that yeah. were the worst of the worst. But I have to, I just had to say that, like, the whole movie is a low point in just my life, in the career yeah. of Jim Varney, in the directorial career of John R. Cherry III, in the world as a whole since the beginning of creation, and yes. everything that's followed culturally, historically, naturally, and aesthetically. I agree. Well put, Josh. Thank you. Uh, also, I'll, I'll give us a real specific low point. And I think we probably agree on this. I'm sure this is what it is, too. <laughs> because I got two words for you, baby. Hey, you. Hey, you. Oof. Uh, <laughs> let's dig it's into rough. Hey, you. Uh, this is important. We got to talk about Hey, you a lot. Uh, and I don't a, want this to. This is a big oof for all y'all out there. <laughs> this is the biggest oof <laughs> you'll ever encounter. 
as the French would say, it's le grande huif. As I said when I was in France at one time, because I was confused, je suis mozzarella. All right, let's talk about this. Describe this, please. Describe this for the people. Okay. Please so... don't watch this. That's the other thing. Don't watch this movie. Just listen to us talk about it. <laughs> we need to understand something about Hey You real quick. And the thing is, Hey You is comparative to an Ernest persona like Aunt Melba or a lumberjack or that other hairdresser lady. Yeah. The classics. It's a good size. Uh, hey You. And his whole name is Omar Kralala Hey You Biddy Buddy. Oof. Is Ernest showing up out of nowhere at the hotel where he's supposed to be, according to the plot, and not according to any other logistics whatsoever, in nothing but two towels, one covering his lower half, the good Ernest bits, and one covering his head, it's made to look like a turban, and Ernest himself, from turban to lower towel, is in brown face. Brown yes. face, brown chest, brown everything it is excruciatingly racist yeah it's very uncomfortable to watch he's doing a really racist accent and the whole thing with the the character i guess can i uh Hmm? i just i wanted to now the way i describe this and i'm sorry to cut you off nate it sounds bad right like this sounds awful like you feel like it can't get worse right Mm -hmm. wrong baby it gets worse so worse because what what Ernest does in doing the accent he also does a very stereotypical performance of a lowly street urchin in India that is basically a slave of the caste system to crawl on their hands and knees as they enter a room and claim that whoever they're serving is the most powerful, faithful one ever, whose toe jam is the toothpaste of the unworthy, quote. And it is just... Like, I think you and I were cringing so hard that if anyone came up behind us and poked us, we would have fallen apart. Yeah, no, my all every bone in my body just shot out, uh, and my skeleton rolled in a big tumbleweed and disappeared it was it's incredibly uncomfortable i don't really know what much more there is to say about it it's just just absolutely dreadful and because this movie is poorly paced it drags on forever they keep cutting away from him to renee like tied up jabbering at bazoo in like the basement which just draws out the length of this sequence to infinity Mm -hmm. yeah it's just god awful and i don't know it's hard to top i would say another major low point in this movie well that uh, was that was your major low point right oh that was my major low point right yeah what's yours so we have to go to mine well one of mine i had three that i picked out and one of mine was hey you so we got that in common i i want to bet i want to make a bet right now that my next (laughs) two are the same as your next two i think i I will be surprised if they're not uh, yeah, yeah. So my next my next one, in order of how horrible they are, because hey, he's the worst, is a scene where Ernest, being the confident man that he goes up to a nearby tribe to get directions for Renee to figure out where they're going, which we don't even know where they're going. And he is very confident and says to himself, don't worry, I know 19 different Zulu dialects. And then he walks up to these tribe men, right? And you'd think he'd do some kind of stereotypical, like, <laughs> right? And that mm. would be awful. That would be really bad. But no, no, yes. no, no. It, it gets worse, baby. Because what They're he like does... They're, like, creatively <laughs> racist with this part. He walks up to them. First thing he says to them is, hey, homie, how you doing? And then he tries to do a cool handshake with them, and then does a shubba do wop 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 Like a doo-wop thing. It is yeah. fucking awful. So here's the thing, though. Here's the thing that makes it worse. That makes it, like, almost creatively 
racist is he he does do that he says like oh he does walk up and it's basically the i speak jive sequence from airplane but not right funny. which like has aged awfully as well but this is worse but it's so but the thing is he's doing all that stuff and he's saying like hey homie and it's subtitled with different stuff implying that this really is a zulu dialect that's like the chair awful rancid maggot infested cherry on top of this disgusting sunday the awful rancid john archer yeah, I he our our boy let us down so hard with this one. Yeah, that one uh, that's one of mine. That's one of what well, I think I actually maybe then have a fourth low point too. But yeah, that's that sequence is really bad. Um, he also yeah. says that he knows the Zulu dialects because he worked at a record store, which I guess is a reference to a chain of record stores. But is also racist. Yes, yes, it is. Also, Zulu means a specific thing. I, well, I, I, it's just all bad. Uh, there's also, um, there's a little bit more to this. Do you want to get into the other part of this, or do you want to just... I don't even know what you're talking about. What is the other part of this? The knick-knack, Jack, give a dog a bone? No, 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 Josh. It's give a frog a loan. No, no, no. It's give a groan a no. <laughs> but who's on first? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, and it, it cuts away from this to... Renee doing fucking something, I guess. I think she's a harem girl at this point. And then it cuts back. And Ernest and the tribe are friends. And Ernest is, for some reason, telling the tribe about Knick-Knack Paddywhack. And one of the tribe's women is just constantly kissing him for no fucking reason. Yeah, that was weird. And then later on, when Thompson finds this tribe and goes to, like, interrogate them, all the dude can say is knick knack paddywhack now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't and then but then he speaks English to him. That the fucking whole thing is weird and bad. Yeah, yeah. I don't really, I have no idea what else to say about it. Let's move on to another low point. I got one. Alright, I think uh you're you're up next. And I just again I wanna bet my money on this, bet all my Paddington money on this, that the next thing you're gonna talk about starts with a four letter word. Take us away, Nate. Wait, no. I, my, my next low point is the, the the harem girl sequence. Oh, you let me down. I lost all my money. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, we'll get to it when we get to yours, I guess. There's this whole sequence. We already talked about it. We honestly don't need to dwell on this one where Ernest dresses up as a woman and the prince immediately falls in love with him. And there's just like all of this like gross stuff where it's like, oh, no. What if he sees Ernest's face and he sees, sees that Ernest is a man? Yeah, gross. And that sucks, and I hate it. And that's really it. It also goes on for way too long because they don't know what to do in this movie. And the the prince guy is played by like a I think he's played by a British dude. Uh, he's like yeah, yeah, also I, in let brown it be known face. That the the Indian prince is played by a British dude who is also occasionally not always but occasionally in brown face. Yeah, it's it's inconsistent. Y- yeah. Also, at one point, this is not a low point. It's just a thing that happens. He does golf a uh, golf ball directly into a man's mouth, just while he's getting like a briefing on what happened with Ernest or whatever. But yeah, that's that's my low point. Is is the is the harem girl thing? What's your low point? Wow, well, Nate! I can't believe I lost all my Paddington money. That was like at least two hundred and fifty dollars. I'm sorry. You could have bought a Wii at lunch price and i could have bought some new shoes <laughs> uh don't pay hey, if you did josh yes would you misuse them you know i fucking would you would misuse the shoes every squad got that homie that would misuse the shoes and disappoint god that's, that's me baby <laughs> well what are you, what's your low point my low point my third low point of this whole low movie is uh so i think the big thing in this movie is death is really prominent and more so than any earnest movie it's one of the darkest earnest movies ever and that's not yeah. i'm not trying to be like punny oh no no we would never do movie. we would never do that but no you're, you're but right this, this is like the darkest in terms of mortality movies mm-hmm. and we'll talk about the other deaths a little bit later but i want to focus on the death of one individual one small individual one golden individual i forgot this happened yeah this sucks. and his name 
He's Jake. R.I.P. Jake. We love you. Yeah. Oh. Hold on. I'm getting teary. <laughs> so, uh, the artist has his pet goldfish, right? And he, mm. <laughs> he he yo-yos it, and it falls out into the floor, and then he puts it in the sink, and then it it falls into the crunching eater, and then it dies, and it's oh my god, it's awful. Oh, I can't. Just, to, just so I can translate for a second. When Josh says Crunchinator, uh, he does mean garbage disposal. And yeah, did you did you think, well, that's horrific? Uh, yeah, you're right. It is horrific. Ernest pulverizes his pet fish in the garbage disposal by accident. It sucks. I don't like thinking and it about has that. No relevance no, it doesn't. on the plot. You're right. Whatsoever. Ugh. This is an unneeded scene that could have been cut out completely, and it is the worst. Like, it's not as bad as Hey You, no. where we're, like, killing ourselves. But, like, it's still, like, oh, my God, why would they do this? You, you've, you've got a great point. Uh, the other thing that I would say about this is it also is bad, particularly because it makes you wonder, um, what happened to our uh, old Rimshot and Pokey, then? For instance, just fucking careless think, with his beloved pet I fish. think we... We we know what happened to Rimshot. No, and Pokey. They, they went the Crunchinator. No, it's a different timeline, Josh. They're fine. I think. I don't know. I actually have to check my notes on the timeline. Pokey's a camp, and he's good, and he's plotting <laughs> another uprising. Oh uh, boy. Uh, yeah. No, you're right. That's a low point. Also, when you were growing up, your parents didn't call it a Crunchinator. They called it the a, a garbage disposal. Yeah, they called it Uncle Hungry. You're weird. My house, it's called a Crunchinator. No, we call we called it Uncle Hungry. We said feed Uncle Hungry. <laughs> he loves your leftovers and your left hand. Well, my mom played a prank on me when I was a kid, where she pretended oh, to no. get her hand chopped up in the uh, garbage disposal oh, and no. put ketchup all over her hand, and it uh, wigged me out so bad that I just laid down on the floor in shock. I was oh, a very no. sensitive and squeamish little kid. That's <laughs> and now you're the Joker. Yeah, well, that, that Jokerized me. Thanks, Mom. Go, everybody, check out the podcast I do with her called Try Up Brain. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. Now that we're done dealing with goldfish death and putting your mom on blast, uh, <laughs> do you want to give us your last low point? Uh, yeah, my last low point is just the cannibal thing. It's a fucking tired, gross, stupid trope, and it sucks. And I didn't like seeing it, and it's not funny, and I hate it. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, if you if you were at gunpoint and had no choice in your life but to pick a lowest low point of this movie that isn't the whole movie, what would you pick? I would say, I'll see you in hell, dicko. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we can't put that on the wheel. Next time you see me, I'll be smooching the devil. That's what I'll say. No, I would say, hey, you, that is the worst one because it's just so, like, it comes be at the earliest of these, of the really bad ones. It goes on forever. It's just, it's Jim Varney, like, doing it. And it's also, like, it was already bad when he did, like, the racist Indian accent for a little bit in Rides Again. And then they were like, let's have a fucking, make it's like a meal out of this shit. And... The fact that it's, like, not just bad, but it's, like, you're doing this to me again, but worse? Makes it feel worse. So, that is, I think, the lowest low point of this movie. It was the part that I hated the most. And once it happened, I was so, like, burnt out that the rest of them were bad, but they weren't making me, like, cringe into the negative zone the way that this one was. was this one, the Hey You part did. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you, but... We have spent a lot of money to put Wheel on Retainer, mm -hmm. and it's only fair to... We have to pay him in moon dust. Yeah, a lot of moon dust money. And you know where that's so, going. I'm going to have to choose the death of poor Jake as my lowest low point. Just because it was completely unnecessary to the plot, and there's no defending it. Josh, nothing that happens in this movie was necessary to the plot. Listen, this has already been hard enough for no me. No movie has been more I have to unnecessary think about this than this. More than necessary. And also, I have to choose something that isn't hate you. Okay? All right. 
So let's just get this over with. Wheel, tell us why you're better than Buzz Aldrin, and also tell us what is the difference and which one of us is right. Mm-hmm. He agrees with me. He thinks that Hey is bad because he's got a brain. Thank, thank you, Wheel. Thank you. More like he said. He said Buzz Aldrin. More like Buzz. Uh... Pauldron. Because he's actually no more worth than the armor that you put on your shoulder. Yeah, he's more like Buzz Kill Aldrin. And I said, whoa, don't say that. It sounds like you're threatening to kill him. We'll get in trouble. Or he might be <laughs> dead already. I don't actually, I can't remember. <laughs> All right. Well, we got the high, low point, high and low points. And we have to do essentials. But I think before we do essentials, I want to, I feel dirty. Do you feel dirty? I... I don't know if I'll ever feel clean. Well, I think we need to find a way to make ourselves feel clean. I think the way we need to do that is to do this new section, which we're going to call the bubble bath. Yes. Ah, yes. The water is fine. Uh, join us in the bubble bath, where we talk about the things in this movie that were totally baffling. Let's get nice and sudsy, baby. <laughs> Here in the bubble bath. Bubble bath. What do you got, Josh? I'm going to start us off. One of the most baffling things in this movie is the way that Ernest is allowed to keep his yo-yo. Yeah, uh, yeah, they just keep giving it back to him for no reason. Just so he can have it for the plot. Hey, Ernest, we're going to kidnap you, and we're going to take you to Africa in a sack. But hey, here's your yo-yo back, just so, you know, you have time to learn tricks before you get there. Yeah. I agree. I got something to to put in the bubble bath. Okay, go for it. The the beginning of the movie where Ernest gets fired from being a mechanic, the this is just a small detail, but we did talk about it for a weirdly long time while we were watching it. The the woman that whose car he is wrecking is wearing a pastel pink sleeveless pantsuit. <laughs> what was up what with that? What a very strange costuming decision. She also had like a crazy accent that kept changing. From being like midwestern to southern, like any every time she talked, but the costuming choice in particular, I was like, that is a bold decision. <laughs> Nobody in real life would wear a sleeveless pants suit. Yeah, it's, it's nonsense. It's it's like what what is the appropriate situation for that? Because it's like it's not you can't wear it in a pantsuit situation because it's got no sleeves and you look like Hillary Clinton if she was also Larry the Cable Guy. And you can't wear it in a casual situation because it's a pantsuit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a good ad. That's a good ad. I'll go next. There's a point in this movie where Aunt Nelda comes to the rescue to save us from the clutches of Hey You. And she goes down. I was never in my life ever more relieved to see Aunt Nelda. I, it was like she was a beautiful savior. I was like... The, thing, this, the other thing is, like, in contrast, right? Like... The Aunt Nelda bit, he's dressing up as a woman, but, like, the joke is not... It's just that she's a weird character. It's never that, ha-ha, it's a guy dressed up like a lady. And it makes the fact that they do do that lazier version later in this movie all the more egregious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I guess the mm-hmm. balls thing is kind of like a... in goes to jail. But also, that's like... I don't know. It's not just that it's balls. Yeah. El Nelda sees that Renee is tied up with Bazoo and goes in to do her, her thing where she pretends that she's an old lady and is doing her own thing and then distracts Bazoo and frees Renee. But the way she does it is she grabs an urn out of nowhere and claims that it contains the ashes of her late husband, Harold, who died yeah. in some weird cruise ship accident and needs to be put into the furnace because that's what his last wish is. And then she throws this urn at Bazoo to distract him. And you think, you know, it's part of the story. There's not really ashes in the urn. It's just an urn that's going to hit him over the head and knock him out. No, the urn is full of ashes. Whose ashes We never were learned there? whose ashes. We, we never... Why does this hotel have an urn with ashes in it displayed? Not in any way that indicates that it has a dead person's burnt remains in it. And that guy gets splashed with a random person's ashes. It is never... Acknowledged it is yeah weird detail. They somebody had to put those the fake ashes. They had to put the prop dust inside the vase before they broke it. 
So they made a deliberate decision, uh, and I don't understand why. I guess they made it mildly funnier. At least it more notable. It still was just confusing. For sure. So it fits in the bubble bath. Neat. Well, I mean, there's that part where he cuts back to him talking to that tribe, and that woman is just kissing him a bunch for no reason. That was weird. Oh, yeah, that was on my list, too. She just keeps smooching him on the cheek. I don't understand it. There's no reason. It's never explained. It's never established. It's just just every five seconds. Like, literally every five seconds, she kisses him on the cheek. And that's it. The fuck? Is that is that a stereotype that we don't know about? I have no idea. Like I said, that's why it's bad. That's why, it's got, that's why we got to put it here in the bubble bath. You got anything else? I have a few things. Why don't you rapid fire them for me? I'll rapid fire. You got it. <laughs> rapid fire into the bath. R- rapid fire bubble bath. Uh, the best section. Ernest eats bug repellent spray to go in the woods to get firewood, and then does this Ultraman suit up scene, where he all of a sudden has to wear a high tech tiger proof vest, a nuclear brain helmet, literal bunch of nonsense that went too fast for anyone to register. And then also bananas and rhino gloves. The bananas was kind of funny. And it lasts for like a second, and then it never, ever is referenced again. He doesn't even, like, do the Ultraman thing again for the Mortal Kombat fight. Because you think that makes sense, right? No. No, he doesn't do that. Why would he do that? Yeah, that would, that would require this movie to set up and pay off things. Uh, which it has almost less commitment to doing than goes to school. It's like if Coke Sam's came back... And kill John R. Cherry and wore a John R. Cherry suit and make this movie. Yeah. We're on to you, Coke Sam's. What else you got? Later in that scene, Ernest runs in the woods without a chainsaw and then runs back out of the woods, apparently having lost a chainsaw that we never saw him have. Animal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got one now. Speaking of animals, they're, they put weird person sound effects over every time an animal is doing something. Yes! <laughs> The, the, there was a scene with a lion? Yeah, where it's got like a human yawning sound over it. <laughs> yeah, it's literally like a lion roaring. And it's like... Oh, blah. There's a part where there's a rhinoceros running and it's got like a person going... <laughs> like doing like beavis or butthead sounds over it. Yeah, that's real, real baffling. Mm-hmm. It's got big dog with shifty eyes energy. Oh yeah, like uh, like how every animal in an anime movie, regardless of whether it's a T-Rex or an ant, is a mm. dog. Uh, you mentioned this earlier, but my next one was the <laughs> the dude eating the golf ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, a literal, like, blink and you'll miss it scene where Abdul Kazim is playing golf and it goes down to him, the golf ball traveling, and it <laughs> goes in his dude's mouth. Yeah, and we don't see it leave his mouth, so we can assume that that guy just swallowed it whole like a snake eating an egg. We also never see him again. They probably died from eating a golf ball. And then I have two last ones, and then we're done, and then we get out of this bubble bath. I'm sorry, we're getting all sudsy. Uh, we're getting real pruney. <laughs> my last two, uh, the first one is a coordinated harem dance, where Renee was kidnapped and forced to be a harem girl, and then all of a sudden she knows the exact dance to do. Yes. Yeah, and so does Ernest. All, no, no, see, that's the thing. All the harem girls do, which, first off, the, even the idea of this like harem thing with the harem girls and whatever... Like, that's bad in and of itself. That's for classical Orientalism. That shit sucks. Um, but they all can do this dance in synchronous. Part of the bit is that Ernest doesn't know the dance and can't do it right. But he has only arrived, like, a couple minutes after Renee. And they don't do anything with her not knowing the dance. She just does it perfectly. It's it's That's just laziness, I guess, is the explanation for that. Uh, but yeah, no, that shit it was is. weird. Last thing is the ending of the movie. They have Renee in a cage, and she's dangling over a pot of stew for the cannibals, because, uh. you know, racism. And there's, like, this time limit Goldberg machine made of bones and dust <laughs> that slowly lowers her into the pot. Yeah, yeah, they have this... Weird. Yeah, that is weird. <laughs> they have that machine. That's literally made of, like, skulls and rib cages. And the way they start it is they put this egg at the top and they crack the egg. And then just dust falls from the egg and goes down like this weird domino rally nonsense. It's... I couldn't even wrap my head around it, man. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, that that, that is certainly weird. 
Well, let's uh, let's get out of the bath and and dry ourselves off, and discuss the essentials, right? All right, let's get, let's get into them essentials. Let's get some essential oils. We'll add those a little bit later. No, we're getting too central, Josh. We're not allowed to be horny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hat and vest. Ernest has a hat. It's a cheap hat, but it's a hat. And it's a and he has the vest, yeah. so it's it's there. Low status with ambition slash class struggle. Now, not really. I mean, his status his is status low, is low. Sure. He has ambition to maybe lower than we've ever to seen. get the girl and have an adventure. And there is an element of class struggle. Yeah, you know, you're right. You know, it's got it. It's just it's not. It's the the. I don't like. It's the least I've liked this. But yeah, for sure, it's the racist there. class struggle. <laughs> Well, no, no, no. Well, because he the... plays, he plays the street urchin. Oh yeah, you're right. That's that's the the dark. Well, no, that is the the sort of uh, grim shadow of the class struggle thing. But there's also like Thompson is like a posh British guy. There's the prince. Like he, both of his enemies are higher status than he is. So it's uh, but yeah, you're right. No, you're right. Craftsman. Craftsman? Uh... Yeah, but also the, he makes the weakest yo-yo. craftsman ever. There's a montage of him creating the yo-yo. He buys the diamonds. He turns them into the yo-yo. Such a boring montage. And can you describe this, please? The world. It's just, I mean, it's just a dude doing crafts. It's so boring. All he does is, like, paint the yo-yo and, like, he glues, like, a little dowel between it to be the sort of axle for the... Uh, yo-yo. It also has the worst Ernest puts a thing in his mouth bit, where he kind of like glues, he accidentally like glues his lips for a little bit, and it's just like, it's the only joke of it is just him like yanking on the glue and he's making like duck lips. It's not, it sucks. It's a, it's so disappointing in comparison to, you know, Ernest with the the pen in his mouth and goes to jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, he, he, he's like, it's the most literal it's been. It just does some arts and crafts in this movie. But yeah, there's no like he he doesn't make any real like Rube Goldberg machines or anything. But yeah, it is technically there. I think that's the thing with this. This movie is technically has the earnest, a lot of the earnest elements, but not it's lacking in the earnest charm. It's also just lazy. Like there's like these yes, elements. It's, it's literally like we're checking off a list. It's also like they're checking off a list in the worst way possible. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Speaking of that, we got folksy wisdom. Yes. Yeah, it's there. This little bit's particularly funny though. We didn't even like really shout out any of it. Catchphrases, yeah, I guess they do a lot of the e. Like there's more of that in this movie than I think in any of the other ones. I mean, they were compensating for the fact they didn't do it in the last two weeks. That's I true. guess you get a little, you know, you you know what I mean. He does he do the snicker? Yeah, he does. Oh, I don't even remember. Uh, there's slapstick comedy, but it's the less tedious slapstick comedy we've gotten in any of these yet there's mm-hmm. really no like like the ostrich egg chase is the most notable set piece and even that is like not very good it's not really filmed in a really dynamic way yeah it's real underwhelming now we have uh friend all children so child at heart now he's I definitely mean, a child I'd, at heart. I'd make the argument that he's a child at heart yeah because he turns fucking diamonds into a yo-yo yeah but uh, there's no children in this movie, thank God. Yeah, and, you said uh, it, buddy. The, that's, that's all I gotta say about that. Complicated relationship with machines and animals? I mean, yes. Yeah. Kind of, there's not really... Is there a machines bit in this movie? Uh, I mean, he gets hit with the yo-yo, and like, there's the, the chain... Yo-yo chain yo is sequence. not a machine. Yo-yo's a machine, it's literally a machine, it's a simple machine. Fucking bring it up with Play-Doh. Okay, or okay, Aristotle. All right. Maybe Aristotle. I don't know. I'm not smart. Yeah, it's just not... Well, there's also the thing with him in the uh, in the car in the beginning. Yeah, that's true. He does uh, get screwed he up by a car. He himself on like a, one of those lift jacks in a mechanic shop. Like I said, it's not, it's not very good in this. <laughs> and the animal thing sucks. There's also poor Jake. And yeah. uh, there's also the elephant scene, which we can talk about now. I thought about adding to the bubble bath. Where there's an elongated padded for time scene where Ernest runs back and forth trying to get in the side of a Google car but can't because there's an elephant in his way. Yeah. And it literally lasts like five minutes and it's awful. Yeah, so much of this movie is too fucking long. It's like they had to justify getting the elephants in this movie 
by the amount of time the elephants were on screen. I also feels like they got the elephants and then realized they couldn't make them do anything. So they just had to have this scene where he just runs around near them. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, I mean, check. So, incompetent slash inept. 100%. For, for sure. Cartoon violence. Yes. Yeah. Overly and quickly confident. Sometimes. Not yeah, always. There's a, this, there's a whole section there. of this movie where Ernest loses his confidence completely and wants to be left to die. Oh, God. Yeah, he keeps wanting... <laughs> That's actually, you know, it was... I don't think that in and of itself was funny, but, like, the idea where they We did laugh at that, where it's like, Ernest is just like, oh, we're never gonna make it, let's just stop. And the movie doesn't acknowledge it, but it's like, Ernest is saying that they should just die, right? Like, that's the the logical result of what he's suggesting. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip the next one for a second. Easily bamboozled slash distracted, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastical element. No. No, right? No. I mean, they're in, they're in Africa, I guess, That's... and they're diamonds, but the diamonds aren't special. They're just like part of a statue. Yeah, there's nothing. There's not. There's no no sort of sci-fi or fantasy element here, uh, and I, I think it's part of why the movie is so unengaging. To be honest, I mean, yeah. here's the thing though: can you imagine if they actually did try to do it though? How bad it would be? Yeah. I mean, I'm glad they didn't attempt it, but it's definitely a thing that's missing from this movie. Chaos, check. For sure. Yeah. Ernest must suffer physically and emotionally, but ultimately triumph. Now, he definitely suffers physically and emotionally, but does he triumph? No. This is a really deflating ending. I do kind of like that it's, like, again, sort of cynical, where it's like he goes through all this work and then she's like, actually, you're too exciting. But it doesn't feel good. Like, you go through this whole movie that sucks, and then Ernest doesn't even get to be with the girl he likes at the yeah, end. Yeah, he, he, he like, does get with a girl that he likes at the end of goes to school. Why couldn't he do it here? Yeah. No, yeah, this was... I He he doesn't ultimately triumph, and I think that is another... It is a minor problem with this movie, but it's definitely something that contributed to the overall bad feeling I ended up having about this movie. Yeah, it ends with him smashing an egg in his head. Yeah, that's true. I don't want to be, like, I don't want people to think that I feel like, oh, the male protagonist gets to the movie and he should be rewarded with a woman. But it's like this whole movie was about him trying to win her over and, like, them both realizing, like, that they're not ordinary schmoes. And, like, then that character arc is completely discarded at the end. And it's like, if the movie had not been about him, like, trying to win her over and her warming up to him, then I wouldn't have cared that they don't end up at the end. But it's like, that was what the movie was about. Yeah, I mean, also, like, there could have a way to, like, change that, where she's like, you'll find a girl who will take care of you and is the right person for you, and, like, sets them up with somebody else or something. Who knows? I I do like that she kind of bigs him up at the end. Or that they, like, maintain, like, a best friendship. Like, I can't date you, but, like, I want to be your friend because I want adventure in my life, and we can do it as friends. You know what I mean? Yeah. Here's the thing. Here's what my pitch would have been. What I think would have been funnier and would have felt better is it should have ended with him being like, look, you know, I we went through all this. And what I realize now is that, like, I'm a lone wolf and my life is too dangerous and I can't be with you. I'm sorry, Renee. And he walks off into the sunset like it ends with him doing the thing from the beginning of Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I think would have been a better ending. Yeah, he would ultimately triumph. There's no sex thing. It's that's, that's really good. Yeah. So next one is self sacrifice, and no. he agrees to fight a guy to the death. Is it sacrifice though? He could die. I think it is. I just don't think it's very good. It's it's like everything in this movie. It's not very good, but it's there. Okay. Uh, Ernest has to hit rock bottom. He kind of does. I guess yeah, it doesn't does. feel like it. It's the least emotionally affecting this has been. Him, like, just wanting to be left to die? <laughs> it's it's also, like, not... The movie doesn't really use it for much. It just it sort of happens. It's like, oh, wow, I guess Ernest is really depressed in this scene? Weird. Yeah, but it's definitely there. Yeah, but it's not. it doesn't have the same effect of, like, him mourning the loss of his job or him crawling into a tuba to die. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Yes, I agree. This is... <laughs> this is not as... Again, not as good, but it is there. Now, here's, uh, we have to, so we had a, a guest, R.I.P., Tyler the Football, who <laughs> made a good point 
that we can't just call the antagonist of the movie Ernest Hater. There has to be, like, a secondary, like, hater for Ernest that isn't just, like, you know, that one dude that is yeah. the main villain of the movie. Like how there was Nash and Poodle Smurf. Yeah. Like, Nash is the villain, Poodle Smurf is the hater. This doesn't really have that. This it's doesn't happen. It's antagonist, but there, one doesn't really ever even learn that Ernest exists. And the other one doesn't learn that Ernest isn't Agent 32. Yeah. I think we should keep this on the list, though, because I think this does add something. Having that other character there that just personally despises Ernest, I think, is good. That's, uh, I think this is a point for keeping on the list, because this movie sucks. Yeah. yeah and I... neither villain really cements. God, the villains are really disappointing. I mean, Thompson in particular, I wish they had just gone harder. Like, if the bit had been that he is convinced that Ernest is, like, super competent, and, and he's constantly being like, well played, hmm... Again, we continue our dangerous game of cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but, like, he doesn't really do that, and it's not funny, and it sucks. And he's a big missed opportunity for jokes. Yeah, uh, and then you mentioned this earlier, two-character trope, not in this movie. Not at all. Again, it's, like, a, a reason to include it in this list, because this movie's weaker for it, because they literally padded through time, cutting back and forth the nonsense scenes. You know, we could have used the two-character trope. Uh, absolutely. I agree. And then, finally, opening credits set to a goofy tone. Now, we do have that. Yeah, it's just the cheapest one they've ever done. Yeah, it's it's basically the same as Scared Stupid, but with tribal effects. And then, at the end, Ernest is scared by a cannibal tribesman. Yeah, so they get the racism in real early. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess, like, I feel like definitely keep this on the list. Like, it was there, and we were like, oh, okay. It did kind of lull us into a false sense of security, but then it was racist at the end. But also, like, I wouldn't have not had this in the movie. If I could, if you, this was cut out, I think the movie would be ever so slightly worse off for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I think we've gone through the essentials. You have your timeline theory stuff. I oh. have a personal theory as to why this movie's off. And I want to get okay. to that with your timeline theory stuff. But there's also just a few things that I feel like we should mention. Now, we've talked in previously, and I've gone through this in excruciating detail, about like the dumb quotes and shit that happens in these Ernest movies. And I just want to run through three really quickly and be done with them in what I okay. call QQ, the quote corner. Okay. Hit me with some quotes, baby. Okay. I think one of like the... I don't know if this is actually happens or not or i made it up in my mind because i wanted it to happen when ernest starts the ostrich fight he says this means laurel and that was pretty good that's a good that's a good quote i don't think he says that though i think he just says this means war and then i said war all oh now i want to cry again <laughs> another quote is when renee apologized for being a snob and then this follows up by defining a snob as wanting things that could never be. What? Well, yeah, that's not what a snob is. I, I, that, that should have been in the bubble bath. I, that made me mad because I was like, what are you talking about? And it wasn't like the joke was that she was wrong. She just says a thing that doesn't make any sense. Speaking of her saying things that don't make any sense, falling into my last object of quote corner is her and her companion Bazoo. First, she insults him by saying bad things about his hygiene, but she also calls him a pool ball. Yeah. Which is like, you know, did she mean cue ball? Because he's bald, but you can't call him a cue ball because a cue ball is white and he's not white? What's up with that? I hope it's just that they're weird or that it's a Canadian thing and that wasn't the case. But you can't help but think that when they say it, which is like, yeah. They, uh, yeah. yeah. And then she tells him that he has soggy Cheerios. And as they cut between Ernest doing his Hey You and back to her just doing shit with Bazoo, she sings a song about the Flintstones, tells him that she was a cheerleader once, and I asked him to do a cartwheel, and tells Bazoo that she's going to throw up all her cookies on his boots, and they're going to be sticky for weeks. Yeah. Sorry for making the podcast horny again. Oh, God. That's, I forgive you. But I have to. I have to make the podcast horny. You know why? Because her scenes with her tied up, with this big, muscly Bazoo, feel like a poor scene they have very creepy energy in these parts there's a lot of like her legs in this movie there's there's a part where Ernest is doing some goofball shit i think when he's suiting up in that one scene and they just keep cutting back to her standing by the fire and she's standing in like a pinup pose with her leg out and it's like 
I know the director told her to stand like that, and it's gross. Yeah, they really play... Like, she's supposed to be the nerdy, like, chick that Ernest can get. It's not girl. Mm-hmm. It's not girl type. If I say that three times fast, hopefully Tyler will return. <laughs> <laughs> but they also make her super leggy, and it's it's gross. I mean, it's it's fine. Like, she's a, she's attractive, but, like, it's, like, gross in the way they do it. You know what I mean? Well, I think part of the problem is, like... Well, one, it's, like, that's, like, so much of her content is just that in this movie. It's also, like, this is a kid's movie. Like, but it's, like, I feel like that's so far down on the list of things that are bad. Yeah. Uh, my last quote, I already mentioned this. Uh, oh, powerful one whose toe jam is a toothpaste of the unworthy. It is awful. So, yeah, it's a, it's did, did you have anything to add for Quote Corner? No, no. I want to get into the timeline. All right, get into that timeline, and I'll do my theory. So, okay, so, uh... Every, people people in the know know that part of the inspiration for the way no, no, no. Yes. People anyway, part of the inspiration for the way I set up this timeline was uh the the official the official Legend of Zelda timeline, which is uh stupid. But recently I got a Nintendo Switch Lite and I played uh Legend of Zelda the Breath of the Wild for the first time. And that is sort of I guess to put it in terms that I know you'll understand, Josh, to make it sort of more relatable to you. It's kind of the turn A Gundam of The Legend of Zelda. Um. <laughs> it does this thing that t- turn A Gundam and Breath of the Wild, they're both p- they take place in a franchise that has multiple timelines. Uh, but they do this thing where they're set so far in the future that it becomes the future of all of those timelines. Oh, so it's like anti Skyward Sword. Yeah, 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 yes. I get it. I get it. And by that, I mean Skyward Sword is Zelda one that's like, oh, this one is the first one. Mm-hmm. Breath of the Wild is the last one. Yes. Except now they're making a sequel to it. So it's the second to last one. <laughs> but, so... Unless the sequel is also a prequel, a per-sequel, if you will. Who knows? Could be anything. Uh, so my theory now is that Ghost to Camp is our Skyward Sword. Okay. And that Slam Dunk Ernest is our Breath of the Wild. And that's why it has all the references to the other Ernest movies that are technically in other timelines. Okay. Because the timelines have fused at, by some point uh, before Slam Dunk Ernest. Now, my theory for this movie, originally we were watching it, and I was like, um, I don't know. This could kind of fit anywhere. Maybe it's like post-camp, but pre-jail. It's before he gets rim shot. Because I assumed he wasn't actually going to end up with the girl at the end, even though... He, you know, that's what the movie was about. But then I got to the end and she gives him this speech about how he's Louisiana Smith and he needs adventure. And I was like, this is a prequel to Ernest Rides Again. That's why he's like that in Ernest Rides Again. He's okay. a broken man in Ernest Rides Again. But he's trying okay. to be the adventurer that she said he was. But he stumbled mm. into that adventure. and he, he So he's trying to force it by goofing around on construction sites. So my current setup for the timeline is that it starts with and with camp and then splits. And in the failure timeline, I've deci- I've abandoned my false earnest theory and I think it goes goes to school, saves Christmas, scared stupid, and then they they both meet up at Slam Dunk Ernest, but in the meantime, in the victory timeline, it's goes to camp, then goes to Africa, then rides again, then goes to jail. Okay. And that is my unified Ernest timeline. You're abandoning the movie timeline. This is just, like, all yeah. of it. And then after it goes to jail, it coalesces into Slam Dunk? Okay, so here's the thing. I think that my my current theory is that in both versions where Ernest succeeds and fails, he do- undergoes the trial of the, what is it, the blade, the stone, and the arrow? Mm-hmm. And gains immortality. Part of my theory is that he undergoes the trial of the blade, the stone, and the arrow in mm-hmm. both timelines. But the reason the failure timeline is the failure timeline is because he doesn't realize it. And so he doesn't know that he's immortal and his hero's heart is buried under the sorrow of losing the camp. Then That's why scared... he's not confident. Yes. And then in Scared Stupid, he becomes fully the hero again and defeats Trantor. And he goes to jail... Uh, you know, he defeats his dark shadow and becomes the fully realized hero Ernest. 
and the timelines fuse back together for Slam Dunk Ernest, where he receives his final test at the hands of God. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. You know what? I can get behind that. But I think what you're saying is there's a crucial missing link in your timeline where the timelines sync up into Slam Dunk somehow. We're going to have to find that missing link. Well, that might be our that might be our movie. That might be our movie. Secret Agent Ernest might be the missing link. Yeah. It's like a Christopher Nolan movie. Like, it's like a spy movie with multiverse shit. And it ends with Ernest fusing the timelines. It's Ernest Tennant, but instead of yes. Tennant spelled like, it's like Ernest, the name Ernest. <laughs> it doesn't work because it's not a palette. <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, cool. I want to say about Tennant. We might cut, you might cut this out of the podcast. Um, hey, uh, you watched Tennant? F- no, I didn't watch it. But uh, uh, I it did sucks. Don't watch it. About it's it. a waste of time. <laughs> it's real bad. <laughs> Uh, you you had your theory. I need to lay my theory on the line. Okay. Now, this movie, it sucks, right? This movie as a whole is awful. And here's why, in my mind, I think this movie is cursed. It is cursed. We've talked about this. We went through the essentials. This movie has, out of our 21 essentials, checked off 17 of them. And you think that'd make it a good earnest movie. Mm-hmm. But there's one crucial essential that it fails to check off. And from that point on, the movie is cursed and doomed to fail. All right. Early in the movie, as Ernest goes to the Waffle House stand-in and meets up with his crush, Renee, he eats a French fry. He does eat a french fry. And it's a couple times in this movie. After that, it just goes downhill. And I will further venture that later on in this movie, when he does that awful scene that is your low point of, is he a man? Distress. He eats more food. Mm. He eats grapes. Oh, he eats a turkey leg. He eats watermelon. And the movie gets worse. You know what, Josh? When you first started talking about the eating thing, I thought you were out of your mind. I thought you had completely lost it and you were going to ruin the whole podcast. I secretly conspired behind your back to have you committed like a jealous husband in a Victorian novel. You were Macbething me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But now I see that you are, in fact, right, and that's the only rational explanation for why this movie's bad. It's not because they've been making these for a really long time and this has less money and they've lost interest. Uh, it's definitely because they broke some sort of cosmic taboo by making Ernest eat a French fry in the beginning of the movie. They shouldn't have done it. It's like uh, it's like touching the, the cursed stone. It's like summoning the Wishmaster. You don't do it. And they did it. Mm-hmm. And that's why. And the world is ruined forever. I can't wait for a season on Wishmaster. Wishmaster and Commander. Dude, that would be... I actually that, That's awesome. I want to do that. I love Wishmaster. <laughs> okay. The thing is, Nate. Ernest... Mm-hmm can't eat and this movie fucked that up okay so i was gonna say are you suggesting that because he eats this is like not earnest that this is this is the false earnest is that your is your hypothesis is the false prophet (laughs) uh no this is i don't i don't this isn't the false earnest this is just they 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 ruined it immediately and that's what it is so that's yeah. That's my theory. I'm putting it out there. Judge me all you want. Fire me from Paddington. I don't care anymore. Only God and the Archangel of Basketball can judge you. Now I have one last new segment, and then we can talk about where we're headed from here. But I want to just do a quick side character shout out. <laughs> all right. We got to talk about Moist Mouth. Moist Mouth. Moist mouth. What do I mean by moist mouth? I mean some hired dude who works for Abdul Kazim that is the go-between for Thompson where they're negotiating money and the entire thing that is his character is he has a handkerchief and he constantly puts it to his mouth for no reason. Yeah, this guy is not in the movie for very long and doesn't really do anything, but he gets to hang around during the whole Hey You scene and before that, and he just has this inexplicable bit of business where he's constantly dabbing his wet mouth. Uh, cool. 
Cool, good, cool job, movie. Good job, Moist Mouth. Second shout out. We got to talk about Robos, the third yeah. brown faced character in this movie. He's where there isn't the just one, one brown face, there isn't just two brown face, there is three brown face characters in this movie. And one of them. Yeah, this would be egregious if the movie was made in the 50s. One of them is a guy who is white but became brown and stole from the guys who stole from the guys who stole from the guys. And then he gets cornered and put in a limo and dies by snakes, even though he doesn't know what a cobra is or snakes that are dangerous. Mm. Robots. Yes. This is the worst bag of snakes movie, uh, bag of snakes scene in an earnest. (laughs) This is the worst bag of snakes movie. Yeah, probably is the worst bag of snakes movie. (laughs) We're being honest. I can't think of a worse one. And I got two more. Real quick, we need to give a shout out to the shitty ostrich farmer. Feels up Renee. Is a creepazoid. Is a creepoid. And he sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, we got to give a shout out and an RIP to those two thugs who got run over by a rhino with their heads chopped off. Poor guys. Definitely dead. Yeah, and a really brutal way to die. Awful dark in this movie all right it's it's like um if you haven't seen have you seen any of the fast and the furious movies yeah i i i saw one and i saw three and i saw um uh the one where jason statham is fighting the rock oh hobbs and shaw yeah yeah. um in too fast too furious which is a pretty goofy movie tonally but there is a part where they just they cut to the villain and he's doing a hot rat bucket torture on character actor Mark Boone Jr. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, and that's like a strangely horrific and grim thing that happens in the middle of this goofball action movie. It is. It really is. Kind of what happens here, except we don't get the benefit of character actor Mark Boone Jr. What a shame. Well, this has been Side Character shout out. And we are through with my weird and random sections. So, Nate, take us from here. We have suffered for our audience. We have suffered for the world. We have watched Ernest Goes to Africa. Where, where do we go to from here? Well, we're, we're in the home stretch. Uh, our next episode is going to be our penultimate episode of the season. Maybe. Depends on how our plans for the finale go. But it will be the last movie that we are discussing before we make our final pitch. Uh, it is the final Ernest film, and it is Ernest in the Army. Well. A movie that I remember being okay, but could be worse than I remember. Or better. Who knows? Well, that movie may blow us away, but I think we also uh, are missing an Ernest movie in our franchise. I mean, I think it's not really an Ernest movie, but at some point, we do have to watch Dr. Otto and the Riddle of the Gloom Bean, don't we? Yeah, I guess we do. You're right. We should watch that. We'll throw that in as like a little bonus episode. Give give the fans what they want. Okay. I think we got everything covered. We've talked about so much and not enough. But you know what? This movie, no one else needs to see it ever again. Yeah. So we've done a service to our society. And well, we may be jokers, but the audience will. And for that, we're heroes. And I just want to say goodbye to our friends at Touchdown Boys. It's been a long time since you got a touchdown. And I'm bad about it when I touch down again. I'm going to fade out on that. You should fade out on that. You're editing it, not me. Okay. Well, you fade out on that. I'm going to say, until next time, remember, there's a right and wrong in the universe. A distinction is not hard to make. You know what I mean? All of you, Vern. But now you got to move, Vern.